Thank you. Um, I want to talk about the impact of peers on uh, adolescent behavior. If you think about the lifespan, among all the periods of life, the most dangerous is adolescence. And adolescence also happens to be the period of the lifespan in which peers are probably the most important. Now, we can say lots of positive things about teenagers and adolescents. They're energetic, they're passionate, they're fun to be around, they're interesting. But one of the things that's also characteristic of people this age is that they take a lot of risks. They do a lot of restless things. And those reckless things have serious consequences. So compared to other age groups, adolescents have more automobile crashes. They commit more violent and nonviolent crime. They attempt suicide more often and other kinds of self-inflicted injury. They also drown more often, which is really interesting considering that adolescents typically are much stronger um, than adults and children, but yet adolescents have a higher rate of accidental drowning than any other age group. So we've been wondering, psychologists have been wondering for a long time, why do teenagers take risks? And a lot of the things that you probably believe about that turn out not to be true. It's not because they're ignorant. It's not because they're irrational. It's not because they think they're invulnerable. So why is risk taking higher during adolescence than during other periods in the lifespan? Because they're supposed to take risks. This is a finding that's emerging in our work and in other research on adolescent development that's been informed by advances in adolescent neuroscience. In order to understand this, we need to think about adolescents in other species. So all mammals go through puberty, just like we do. And therefore, you can make models of adolescent development by looking at other species. And when a mammal goes through puberty, it leaves its home environment, and it goes out into the wild in search of a mate, or maybe a couple of mates. And that's really dangerous, and that's really risky, because there are predators and there are competitors. So in order for animals to reproduce, they have to be willing to take risks. And we now think that evolution has hardwired this period in the lifespan to be one where people are more willing to behave in risky ways. So around the time of puberty, there are major changes in a part of the brain called the limbic system, which is shown here in blue. And these changes involve a neurotransmitter called dopamine. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that's very important for our experience of pleasure. So when you are anticipating something very pleasurable, like food or sex or money, you get a little dopamine squirt going on there. And there's more dopamine activity in the brain during adolescence than at any other time in development. So I hate to break it to you, but nothing for the rest of your life will ever feel as good as it did when you were a teenager. So this dopamine reward system is being activated and aroused during early adolescence. But at the same time, a different brain system, shown here in green, located in the prefrontal cortex behind your forehead, is developing, but it's developing very, very slowly. And this is a part of the brain that puts the brakes on impulses, that allows us to think ahead and plan ahead. So when this reward system, this dopamine reward system, is being activated at around the time of puberty, it happens against a backdrop of very immature self-control. And the result of this is pressing on the accelerator without having a good braking system in place. And this is what leads to a lot of risky and reckless behavior. Now, we know that a lot of the risky behavior that teenagers engage in they do with their friends. And I'm sure if you think back about your own teenage years, I know this is true for me, you can probably think of many, many experiences, escapades, adventures that you went on with your friends that were really stupid that you would never have done by yourself. And in the real world, we have statistics showing this. If you look at passenger crash data and you look at the likelihood of a crash as a function of how many people are in the car, what you see is that the likelihood goes up dramatically if the driver is a teenager, but it doesn't change at all if the driver is an adult. 
So we've been trying to understand what it is about peers that makes teenagers act in risky ways. So we do experiments in our lab where we have people come to the lab and take a test battery that measures things like risk taking and decision making and they either take the test battery by themselves or they take it with two of their friends watching them. And we do this with kids and college students um, and adults. And one of the tests that we've used is a driving test. And it simulates a situation that will be familiar to many of you, in which you're in a hurry to get someplace, and you approach an intersection, and the light turns yellow, and you need to make a decision about whether you're going to try to run that light or not. Is that familiar to some of you out there? Right? So we measure whether people try to go through these intersections or not as a measure of how risky they are. And what we found is that when adolescents are playing this game alone, they don't take any more risks than adults do. But all you have to do is have their friends watching them play this game, and it increases the number of risks that they take. So we wanted to understand, really, what was going on. So we decided to do this kind of research using brain imaging. So we can take these kinds of tasks and we can give them to people while we're scanning their brains, and then we can use fMRI to look at brain activity. And we can compare the brain activity of individuals when they're taking these tasks by themselves with the brain activity when their friends are watching them. And what's interesting about this uh, uh, variation of our experiment is that the friends aren't even in the same room with them. We can't squeeze them all into the scanner together. So the friends are in another room watching their performance on a monitor. The subject knows when their friends can see how he or she is driving and when they can't. But they can't communicate with each other. And what we found was really interesting, that when adolescents are being watched by their friends, it activates the reward centers of their brain, shown in that yellow rectangle. So here's the comparison of adolescents playing this driving game with their friends watching versus with their friends alone. And those areas inside the yellow rectangles are the brain's reward centers. We don't see this in adults. The adult brain activity is the same, whether their friends are watching them or whether they're playing the game by themselves. So peers have an effect on the way that adolescents process rewards. Now, we wanted to understand this more, and I'm sure that some of you have some idea of why this is. You probably think, well, they want to impress their friends. They want to show them how brave or courageous or gutsy they are. So we decided, well, maybe we should do this experiment with adolescents that probably don't think much about what their friends think of them. So we did this experiment with mice. Remember I said that mice go through puberty like all mammals do. So what we did was we took a breed of mice, um, and we created peer groups. So we took a breed of mice, and we um, weaned them from their mothers, and then we took one pup from each of three litters, and we raised them in a cage together. So we created this little three-mouse peer group. And then we decided we were going to randomly take half of these peer groups and test them when the mice were alone, and half of them test with their peers, but we were going to do half the sample when they were adolescents, which is about 30 years old, 30 days old, sorry, and half the sample when they were adults, about 80 days old. And the test was how much alcohol the mice would drink. Now, this is a species of mouse that likes to consume alcohol. It's used in a lot of research to study the effects of alcohol on brain development and behavior in research where we can't use human beings. All right? So you all understand the basic design. Create the peer groups, half of them tested as adolescents, half of them tested as adults, half of the adolescents tested alone, half of the adolescents tested with their friends, half of the adults tested alone, half of the adults tested with their friends. This is really going to amaze you, I hope, because what we find is that adolescent mice, when they are with their friends, drink more than when they are by themselves, but adult mice drink the same amount whether they're by themselves or with their friends. So this impact of peers on the brain of humans may be something that has been conserved across species. And it may have something to do with the fact that we want people to be more willing to engage in reward-seeking behavior when they're in a period where they're fertile and when they're in a period where they spend a lot of time with the people that they're supposed to be mating with. 
So the question I was asked to consider is whether peers change who we are. Well, they don't seem to change who we are, maybe, but certainly during adolescence, they change what we do. And this creates opportunities for risky decisions that threaten the well-being of teenagers and the rest of us. But we have to remember when we think about this that this is in the service of some very important things. Because if adolescents didn't take risks, they wouldn't reproduce. And we need all animals to do that. So that's the peer effect. Bravo, muy Thank bien. Thank you very much. Un Qué, qué honor es para todos nosotros tener la oportunidad de escuchar 12 minutos bien pensados, elaborados, donde cada palabra cuente de gente tan preparada.